Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 63 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. This is a special bonus episode that we've recorded to thank our patrons at patreon.com slash starquest for their generosity in making this and all our shows at StarQuest possible. We gave them early exclusive access, as well as the ability to ask us these questions, but now we're sharing it with you to show you one of the benefits of being a patron. So please enjoy. Welcome to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, which is made possible by you, our patrons on Patreon. We're always looking for ways to thank you for your generosity in making our sh- all our shows on StarQuest possible, and this is just one of those ways. We recently reached out to you and asked if you had questions you'd like to ask, and we got so many great responses, so many. And that's what we'll be talking about today on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy... Uh, welcome to your show and to Thank this dis- this discussion. So um, this is going to be some good some good stuff here, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just to let folks know how we're going to be proceeding, we want to thank as many people as we can, and that means we want to answer as many questions as we can as as a way to do that. So if you ask more than one question, I'll try to answer your second question on our next show. So because we've got so many this time, it's going to fill up this hour easily. But we will get to all your questions, so you don't have to worry. If you asked one, it will be answered, although it may be in our next patrons question show. Today, our, as usual, our answers are going to be fairly brief, but we will be devoting entire future shows to many of the topics that we're going to be discussing here. Also, uh, last time we had a few questions left over from the first patrons question show, and so we're going to start by answering those. Excellent. So let me start with the first one of those. We'll get right to it. Uh, Michael Lindner asked, it's maybe not a mystery per se, but gun control. I hear one side claim that places with more gun control have lower homicide rates, but the other side claims that in the same location, homicide rates do not go down when gun control is passed. Likewise, one side claims the U.S. is number one in the mass shooting rate. The other side claims the U.S. is really number 12. Is one side or both just cherry picking data? Is there data out there? It would be nice to see facts presented by someone who has your stellar reputation for honest and unbiased research. Well, thank you, Michael. At, at this point, so at this point, I've I've listed gun control as a future topic for the show because it is controversial. And so there is a mystery there because I think that at least one side is cherry picking data. And frankly, people on both sides of any debate are at times going to cherry pick data. But I think that that is clearly going on here. Exactly the degree to which it happens and exactly which side of the debate has the better case is something I'm still in the process of researching. We will have in the further resources a link to Wikipedia's article about a book by a gentleman named John Lott. The book is called More Guns, Less Crime. And he very much advocates the um, the pro-gun availability position. I mean, his argument is when you have, at least in America, this doesn't necessarily hold for all countries, but at least here in America, the places where guns are more accessible, you actually have less crime. And he uses statistics to argue that. However, what is good about the Wikipedia page is it not only gives an overview of his arguments, and of course, you can get his book to read more, but it also has uh, critiques of his position as well. So you can see both sides of the debate specifically as it relates to the arguments that Lot has put forward. So, you know, check out both sides there and we'll uh, try to have a future episode on this. I'm not sure exactly what point, but we will have one. Uh, Until then, remember the old saying, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. (laughs) That's right. Okay. So uh, our next question comes from Teresa Nolan. Uh, She says, Bob Lazar, why would he know anything about the person who did his background check? These days, people don't. The background checker talks with the people listed on your application, but not with you. Also, you suggested that perhaps Mr. Lazar's background checker, I I don't remember his name, might be a drinking buddy. I'm surprised they would be spending any time together because I would have thought a background checker would not 
be stationed in the Nevada desert, but rather in a metropolitan area where he could more easily travel and verify backgrounds. So our Bob Lazar episode was episode number 22, if you want to go back and check that out and listen to the discussion in context about that. Uh, Lazar did name a particular individual as the one who checked his background, and then Jeremy Corbell, a documentary maker, found the guy, and he wouldn't go into specifics because, you know, non-disclosure agreements and stuff, but he uh, did confirm that he did do that type of work during the time period that uh, Lazar background would have been checked in terms of the um in, in terms of the lazar situation it could be that i mentioned it could be like they were drinking buddies or something so they knew each other apart from lazar's work at area 51 and consequently he might not have even been spoken to by his background checker but he knew who this guy was and so he could use his name knowing that he did this kind of work and because of the NDE, NDE, he couldn't, or NDA, he couldn't really say, well, I didn't work on Lazar's case. So that's a possibility. In terms of him being located there in Nevada, I don't think that's implausible. There are a lot of defense facilities in Nevada. The employees live there. And so if you're going to check their backgrounds, you need people on the ground in Nevada to go talk to their associates. And I would expect that, like a lot of employees at Area 51, the background checker may have been based out of Las Vegas. It's a major metropolitan center. It's right there near Area 51. They run daily flights on Janet Airlines between Las Vegas and Area 51. And so I would suspect he probably lived there, like a lot of other employees of the facility, and would do background checks among the inhabitants of the area. Then Victor Lambs asks, and perhaps you've answered some of these on Catholic Answers, but Juan Diego's Tilma, did NASA really investigate it? Uh, the Flying House of Loretto, really transported by angels? I saw a headline on this recently, I think. I know, I know. Read the book, <laughs> is what he says. Well, it, it's not just a question of reading the book, but reading the right book, because you can find books that will say anything, just like you can find people that will say anything. In the case of the idea that NASA studied Juan Diego's Tilma, the answer seems to be no. And I'll, we'll have in further resources, we'll have a link to a Snopes article on that. And I know Snopes is not the ideal fact checker and far from it. But in this case, it looks like the NASA thing is really just fake, that NASA has never published any studies of the Shroud. And uh, it appears that this is based on some research that one guy did. And obviously, lots of people have researched the shroud. The, but it appears the it's based the Tilma. I'm yep. sorry. Uh, lots of people have researched the Tilma. And this one guy published some results in the 70s that then somehow NASA got added to <laughs> in the, in the, in the yeah. public repeating of the story. So it does appear that it's based on some actual research that was done back in the 70s, but then NASA kind of got added as an embellishment. In terms of the Holy House of Laredo, I haven't personally looked into it, but my given the age of the Holy House of Laredo and the quality of the data we have from that era, I'm personally, I would be surprised if it were literally transported by angels. We'll probably yeah. be talking about both of oh, those. Oh, yeah, yeah, F <laughs> future. future topics. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Almost everything we're going to mention here is future topics. <laughs> All right, good. So now we're on to our new questions that we've just got in from our patrons this month. And so the first one is from Aaron Wood, who says, Hi, Jimmy, what's your take on hunted dolls like Annabelle of recent movie fame and Robert in Florida? I, I don't know anything about either of these. Okay, well, I I, I, th I may have heard of the Annabelle movie, but I definitely know about Robert the Haunted Doll from Florida. Mm. Um, he's He's been talked about a lot on the paranormal circuit for a while. In terms of haunted objects, including dolls, it's certainly possible. It, there's a phenomenon that exorcists talk about known as infestation. It's different than possession. Possession is where a demon takes partial or full control of a human being. Infestation is where a demon manifests in association with a particular location or object. Mm. And so you could have a doll that for some reason has become a locus of demonic activity. Also, I couldn't rule out purgatorial ghosts, for example, taking an interest in a doll that was somehow connected to their life. 
or something like that. that They're still working out issues over. Just like we have accounts I, I mentioned in our ghost episode, you know, like reports of a nun who was delinquent in her adoration, then in her afterlife, working off, you know, the consequences of her violation of her um, her vows would then be seen doing adoration in her convent's adoration chapel. And so that's a kind of, you know, purgatorial association with a particular location. And the same thing could happen with an object like a doll. So I, I can't rule it out. I haven't investigated specific instances like Robert the Haunted Doll. Obviously, we want to be, you know, critical in our approach to you know, what does the evidence really say here? Is there really evidence that Robert is a haunted doll versus, yeah, it's a possible phenomenon, but we don't have good evidence in this case. One thing that I think dolls, just for natural reasons, dolls are going to generate more reports of hauntings than other objects, like let's say books or paper clips or things like that. You're going to have much many more haunted dolls than haunted books or paper clips, although there is the King in Yellow um, and the <laughs> Necronomicon. But mm. The reason is that dolls exist in the Uncanny Valley. As uh, people will be aware, uh, the Uncanny Valley is a phenomenon that has been noted where as things get closer and closer to looking human, they get cuter. Thus, puppies are cuter than adult dogs because they have the same big eyes to, compared to their head size that human babies have. So there's a little bit more cuteness there. And anthropomorphic animals like in children's storybooks or Disney movies can be cuter yet. But then when it gets really close to being human and not quite there, it, it triggers a different response in us. It's like something is wrong here. This is maybe diseased. It's maybe a threat. And it, its cuteness drops off and it becomes alarming. And that point at which that happens is the beginning of what's called the uncanny valley, where it's so human but not quite there. And that's why clowns are frequently perceived as being creepy. And it's also why you would find haunted dolls. Mm. Just from natural human psychology, dolls are almost human, but not quite. And that makes them, puts them in the uncanny valley. And thus you have Chucky and things like that. And that's going to, just for natural causes, produce reports of haunted dolls. Incidentally, I have a um, a a story from my own past that's related to this. I had a group of friends in high school and early college and in Arkansas, and they would go camping sometimes. And one time they were camping. I wasn't there for this event, but they had a doll that belonged. It was like a baby doll. It belonged to one of the families that was in the group, and it was not in great shape. It kind of I don't know if you've ever seen Rugrats. It had Angelica's doll Cynthia that has like half the hair plucked out. Uh -huh. And and my uh, my friends had a doll that was kind of in that condition. And they, being young men, young males, were you know a little bit destructive of things, and they ended up decapitating the doll, <laughs> and then. And and mythicizing the doll, they started referring to it as, for some reason, as the Vietnam doll head. And, and they then decided to dispose of the Vietnam doll head by putting it like in a cook stove that they had there where they were camping. And then they opened up the door to the cook stove, I'm not sure why, and saw the head in there staring back at them with an ember in its eye, glowing through, <laughs> peeking through its eye. And that totally freaked them out. And they became half semi-seriously convinced that the deep Vietnam doll head was a supernatural entity of some kind. So <laughs> I have a little bit of haunted doll connection in my own background. There's, there's a reason they make scary movies about haunted dolls. <laughs> yeah. All right. Laurent Steiner asks, a question from both Jimmy and Dom. What is the greatest mystery you have ever come across and among the existing or upcoming episodes of Mysterious World? I'll let you go first, Jimmy. Well, I have to say, I mean, the greatest mystery has to be God because yeah. his mystery is infinite. I hate to say that because it sounds like a cop-out, but it happens to be literally true. I don't really have a way of reckoning greatness on of the kinds of mysteries that we have here on the show they are so diverse. They they don't all fit on the same scale. I mean, some things 
are mysteries in the sense of we just don't know what happened here, but others are mysteries in the sense of, wow, this is really outside of ordinary experience. And I don't, at least at this point, have a way of, of ranking mysteries, but uh, you know, I'll devote some thought to it and see what I can come up with in the future. For my part, I'd have to say like the, the UFO stuff uh, has generally been among the greatest mysteries for me, especially in this show, whether it's the A-tip stuff or the Skinwalker Ranch stuff. Uh, th those, those ones have been the ones that have kind of creeped me out the most or it's sort of made me wonder the most, shall we say. Um, but personally, I've always loved the mysteries, some of the religious mysteries, whether it's the Shroud of Turin uh, or the, the Copper Scroll. I love the Copper Scroll and what it may represent. That's the the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones mm -hmm. and me. Uh, so I love that idea. Um, although I, I have a personal uh, mystery that uh, I've run into when I was a kid. And now I have to filter this through i was a child so who knows whether this was actually so this a mystery is, or not this is your vietnam doll head story uh sort of yeah so we, mm -hmm. when i was a kid my my mom had these friends these two women who who lived on a farm in maine and it was a rural farm old farmhouse you know built a uh, hundred some odd years ago that all that whole thing and they had an old farm kitchen and just the, it was very very historic and one of them one time she said she took she was standing in the kitchen and she had a new Polaroid camera. If you remember the Polaroid, it's an instant fil uh, film. Uh, you take the picture, the thing rolls out, and then over time it develops. The the, the image that you took uh, appears. Over five within... minutes or something. Exactly, yes. Very very quickly for the time. Um, we, I mean, we, people who grew up with cell phone cameras don't, don't understand how long it took to see a photo. So she was standing in the kitchen and took a photo from the kitchen's, the doorway, into the living room, which was the next room over. But when it developed... It was of an entirely different room in the house. Hmm. Uh, now, I I found her to be trustworthy. She's a trustworthy uh, person, um, not credulous, uh, analytical. She was trained as a lawyer, you know, analytical. Looking back, I was I was pretty young. Was this a ghost story for a kid? Perhaps, but I I still remember it as something that really freaked me out as a kid. Uh, and I, so obviously, I still remember it. So I'd say as a personal mystery, that's been one of the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. A, a possible natural explanation for that could be that there had been a previous photo taken of the other room that then got jammed in the camera and didn't come out immediately. That's that's a good explanation. Yeah, those uh, the, that could happen with the Polaroid. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that could be. I'd, I'd like to think that. So that's a good one. All right. So uh, our next question is from Jonathan Hill, who says, uh, so first I, I want to preface this by saying mild spoilers for Avengers Endgame. If uh, if you haven't seen Avengers Endgame, it's a mild spoiler. Uh, it doesn't give everything away, but you could kind of guess how the movie ends up. <laughs> so just put it, I just want to throw that out there. So uh, Jonathan says, hey, Jimmy, I'm a big Marvel fan, and I thought of a question related to the movie Endgame based on your time travel episode. You talked about how if someone travels in time to a point where they were not married to their spouse, that that would make it where you were no longer married for a Catholic, from a Catholic perspective. What about that same situation, but related to the snap in Avengers Infinity War, where you have a five-year gap where half of everyone is gone from existence, but then unbeknownst to most of the population, a group is able to reverse it, and then all those people are back. Presumably, some people would have moved on with their lives and maybe even remarried. I know it's a fictional story, but with some of your episodes and talks about other dimensions, I thought more about it happening. Thanks. So, Jimmy, what do you think? Well, I haven't seen Avengers Endgame, but it's such a popular movie and it's been out long enough that that's kind of on me. I'm behind on catching up on the Marvel Universe. The answer, and since I haven't seen it, I, I, I'm missing information that might be in the movie about the exact explanation of all of this. But the answer is going to depend on the method uh, on the reason why people are gone and the method by which they're revived. If you if you want to listen for more context, like our previous discussion of how time travel would affect marriage, uh, you want to listen to episode 29. It was our time travel episode. And basically, the idea was if you go like to a point before your spouse was born or a point after your spouse has died, well, you're not married to your spouse in that time period. But then if you go to a point where your spouse is alive and has already given marital consent to you, well, then you are married to that person. So if, in, if, if you were to cause an event like what Jonathan describes by rewriting history 
So there's a fork in the timeline where certain right. people just didn't exist and then then or cease to exist. Then you wouldn't be married to them in that timeline. I assume, though, since they're brought back, that that's we're not just talking about a divergent timeline. They specifically say in the movie that it is not a divergent a fork in the timeline. That's a very okay. actually big plot point. Yeah. So if so, that would suggest either the people who have been brought back, one of two things has happened to them. Either they cease to exist at the moment the event happened, and then when they were brought back, it like jumped them forward in time five years, or they actually died at the moment the event occurred, and then they're resurrected five years later. Mm. If they were just jumped forward in time, then you may still be, you may well still be married to that person because death did not dissolve your bond with them. They just move forward in time. It's like if I'm married to someone who, if I'm the time traveler's husband and my wife jumps forward five years and then meets me again, well, we're still both alive and we're, we have agreed to exchange uh, marital consent with each other. And so we're still married. And what happens if I didn't know my wife was moving forward in time and I was uh, I married someone else in that five year gap? Well, it would raise questions about the validity of the second marriage that occurred during the five year gap. But it's arguable. I mean, God did allow bigamy in some cases in the Old Testament. It's not his plan, but it could be could be, you know, it was allowed in the Old Testament. And so consequently, you could argue that due to this strange situation where one spouse wasn't in the space-time continuum when I married the other, that I'm legitimately somehow married to both. That's way speculation. I'm not saying that's the case, but it's an issue that would have to be considered because of the weirdness of this. It's kind of comparable to what happened in the Old Testament, maybe. The other option along these lines is I'm just married to my original spouse and my second marriage is invalid. Then what if the person actually dies and is resurrected? Well, we know death from the biblical data, death dissolves the marriage bond and it's not going to be resuscitated when resurrection occurs because we're going to be like the angels in heaven. So it's at least arguable that if this, if half of everybody truly died, and then somehow were raised afterwards, five years later, that you're no longer married to that person. So would Lazarus, if he had been married before his death, when Jesus resurrected him, he wouldn't be married after? In a, I know well, it's, I, that's, yeah. that's why I say it's arguable. Yeah. Which we don't really know. In, in, ca in a case like that, I would assume that the resumption, because it's a return to an ordinary state of life, in a brief time frame that the and just culturally, I would assume that the marriage is, if it were dissolved, it would be implicitly reestablished because you have presumed continuity of marital consent. And so you don't, it's not required by divine law that you have a ceremony for marriage. What's required is that it's a public union based on the consent of the spouses. And so if someone dies for three days and comes back, then and continues to live as husband and wife, you can infer there's still marital consent there and they weren't married to anybody else. So they're married to each other. I think there's like a real world analogy. Like I remember that famous story of was it Davy Crockett who went away traveling for so long that his wife thought he was dead and remarried. And then he mm -hmm. showed it back up again. Uh, there was another guy uh, uh, who's married to his wife. Uh, so it's yeah. not exactly the same thing, but there's that interesting real world analogy. Interesting. That's a good one. Uh, Gregory Fontana asks, I've got a hot question for you. Hot. Uh, quote oh, unquote. here's a pun coming. <laughs> is spontaneous human combustion real? And if so, what is the cause? We'll definitely talk about this in a future episode. The The phenomenon, or there's definitely something that's real here. We do have cases of people who who burned up in their homes in weird ways that that don't conform to the usual patterns of what happens. So like maybe the whole body is gone, except there's like a foot there that the foot is undamaged or things like that. So it, it's definitely something weird. It's not like a house fire. It's just like right here, this chair, this is what burned up with the person in it, and it didn't spread. And so this does happen. The question is, is it is it really spontaneous? Now, 
if you're a drummer in in the tap uh, in the band the spinal tap yes it really <laughs> will happen but in the real world there is at least one plausible natural explanation for this when you look into a lot of these cases it turns out that the person who this happened to had a conjunction of several factors number 1 low mobility Either they were very elderly and couldn't move around a lot, or they were obese and couldn't move around a lot. Number two, they were drinking. So you've got alcohol involved as an accelerant. Number three, they were smoking. <laughs> and so you've got a plausible fire starter here. So if you have someone who is has low mobility and then gets drunk, so they pass out, and they're smoking, when they pass out, a fire can get started. And the hypothesis is that their body fat then serves like the wax of a candle. And you have this, it turned, you know, it's like tallow. It's like other stuff you would burn. And it, that's what produces the effect. That's why it's limited, just like candles are limited unless they come into contact with something else. Like if you tip a candle over, well, then maybe the flame gets on something else. But otherwise, it just burns in place and the candle doesn't burn stuff around it. And so the idea here is maybe that's what's happening. Um, so we'll be talking about that in the future. But that's a first pass kind of look at that phenomenon. All right. Uh, Nick Russell has another one for both you and me. It says, uh, Jimmy and Dom, of all the sci-fi worlds and stories out there, which of them would you like to live in? What I mean is, out of Doctor Who, Star Trek, Star Wars, The Expanse, Marvel, DC, Stargate, Babylon 5, etc., which one would you choose? Jimmy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer in a kind of Rawlsian fashion. <laughs> John Rawls is a political philosopher who, his, who's, his idea of justice was a, how to design a just society is you set up the rules not knowing what your role in the society will be. Mm. So you don't know, oh, I get to be an oligarch at the top, so I'm going to divine, design everything to favor the oligarchs. Right. So you don't know where you're going to end up in society. I would say of all the ones uh, that were mentioned, I would want to end up in probably the Star Trek universe for reasons of prosperity and safety. The odds of ending up as someone who is prosperous and safe in the Star Trek universe is probably greater than in the other ones just mentioned. When I did this, I didn't think of Rawlsian uh, philosophy. So I kind of but it's a tough one because there's so many. They're interesting. If I get to be a Starfleet officer, of course, I want to be in Star Trek and explore. I like the Expanse novels and, and, and TV series. But the body count is way too high in the Expanse. Mm -hmm. Stargate would be cool after the Gua'uld are defeated. <laughs> before mm -hmm. that, it's a little yeah. too dangerous. Uh, likewise, Star Wars at the height of the Old Republic before the, the, the Sith, the Emperor rises, that sort of stuff. And the New Republic is too new. Like So there's a lot of different places you can go. So, uh, But I, I, I guess if I had to pick one, I'd say... I'd say Star Trek as well. Although he said sci-fi, so that eliminated what would be my favorite fictional mm -hmm. universe, which would be Middle Earth. I mean, totally, oh, hands okay. down, I would I would want to be in Middle Earth. Mm. In, in my case, now he didn't mention this one, although it's a subset of the DC universe, but if I could live in the classic Legion of Superheroes time in the 31st century, that could be cool. <laughs> That's cool. Rick Angelini asks, I've been, always been fascinated by the Nazca lines. The obvious question to me is why? Why would an ancient culture go to such extreme efforts to create such complex lines and patterns in the desert floor, given that much of what they created could not be seen without being in the air above them? Was it a mere fluke that the patterns were etched in a unique desert environment that would enable their creations to remain visible hundreds or thousands of years after they were created? I'm not saying it's aliens, but dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so the fact that they're in a desert is actually potentially quite relevant to why the Nazca lines were created. The And it, and it is, in fact, the thing that has enabled them to survive for so long. It's in the uh, Altiplano because... in South America, right? I, f I forget the name of the region, but they were carved or created apparently between 600 B.C. and 200 B.C. So they're more than 2000 years old. OK. And they it has based on an analysis of the of the animals and things depicted in the Nazca lines. It's been suggested that they are connected with the religion of the uh, natives and specifically the production and management of water. Hmm. which is, of course, very important in a desert. 
So like they, they may be connected with aquifers or appeals for rain or things like that. We'll definitely talk about the Nazca lines in the future. I can think of, and other people have proposed, multiple natural explanations for them. Now, the, the notable thing that they get cited for is, ooh, well, they could only be seen from the sky in, in, you know, in their fullness. And the, the Nazca natives didn't have balloons or ways to look at them themselves. So maybe they were meant to be seen by aliens. And maybe, according to Eric von Daniken, they were even alien landing strips. So you could like come down and land on the Nazca lines like a runway. Well, okay, Nova decades ago did an expose of Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods with an with an analysis in one of their episodes. I think it may have been called Crash Go the Chariots, although that was I think also was the title of a book at the time that was a critique of von Daniken. But what I remember from this episode, one of the things I remember from this episode of Nova is they took an image that von Daniken had cited as here's an alien landing strip in the Nazca lines, and then they superimposed it over a real life shot of that video shot, and a guy's walking down the thing, and you can see this is like a path. This is not a runway. This is just a path. Right. That it's, it's human size. And so it's not alien landing strips. Yeah, it's true that unless you're up on a mountain or something, you couldn't see these things, but so what? If you're talking to your gods, it can make a lot of sense to say, let's draw something for the gods to tell them, number one, that we'd like them, and number two, we'd like more water. So worship is a very plausible explanation for these things. Also magic, trying to control water, whether it's underground aquifers or, or whatever else. Also, it's been noted that some of these things seem to have calendrical functions, that if you they're aligned to things like the summer solstice and so forth. And so that's another possible function. It doesn't have to be just one of these. It can be multiple functions, you know, like Stonehenge, obvious astronomical connections, but also probably a center of worship. And so that's likely, and like in Egypt, you have calendrical things like the rising of Sirius that are bound up with the local worship and with magic. And so the same exact conjunction of factors could be at, at play in this case. And it's entirely possible for people to create drawings of things that they can't, you can't see on the ground, but they can map it out in yeah. their head and on the ground that ancient peoples could have done that just as well as we can. Yeah, we, we're, we're as humans, we're really good at, at mind reading, at figuring out what other people would see if we were in their spot. And we can imagine what if we were in the sky, what would this look like? So John Scrivo now writes, uh, Hi, Jimmy, I was interested in your thoughts on the Havana embassy mystery from a couple of years ago. Was it hysteria or is there a secret Doctor Who like sonic weapon involved or maybe just crickets? <laughs> what do you think? So uh, a few years ago in U.S. government employees in at the Havana embassy began to report unpleasant symptoms, you know, headaches, I think dizziness, things like that. And it was the allegation that was made by some was that this was some kind of attack made on them by the Cubans or some other bad actors in Cuba. And I don't find that implausible at all. This is not a unique situation. As part of the Cold War, which even though it's kind of, it's kind of on a low burn right now, there are still these rivalries, and we harass each other. I mean, they harass us, we harass them. It happens, and we're always testing out new things, new ways of uh, new weapons and things like that. We have electromagnetic weapons that can cause a variety of different symptoms, also infrasound acoustical things could be playing a role here. It, on the other hand, it could be uh, chemicals. Some people have proposed it could be insects, or it could have just been hysteria. You know, someone, a couple of people felt bad at the office one day, and it just kind of spread via the paranoia rumor net. So I don't know exactly what happened here, but it is something that is plausible that this could be a form of, of electronic or acoustical harassment. Per Hedetun uh, writes, uh, HARP, mind control, weather control? What do you think? So HARP is a facility up in Alaska. It's HARP with two A's, stands for the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. 
And the idea is that it does research, obviously, on the ionosphere and auroras and so forth. And it, it's claimed this is just a scientific research project, nothing weird here. But there are lots of conspiracy theories about it. We will be talking about it in the future. There are lots of conspiracy theories about it saying maybe it's involved in weather manipulation or mind control or who knows what. And the project, uh, uh, apparently, at least it's claimed it's not active anymore, that it's the government, I guess, defunded it and it's kind of shut down. But before that happened, there were lots of claims that it was some kind of it was not fulfilling its stated purpose, but something much grander. I saw one comment that someone made that the only difference between HARP and some other facilities is that they just didn't let people in to take tours as much to see what was going on there. And that may be true, that that's the only difference, that they just had a different visitor policy. But secret government projects sometimes have fronts. <laughs> and... And you don't want people poking around your front too closely. And so if if the government had a weather manipulation system, it would probably be big enough that you couldn't really hide it very well. And it might be up near the pole, you know, like in Alaska, if you want to influence global weather. And so it's plausible to me that HARP could be something else because secret projects need fronts of one kind or another. If you can put it on a military base that's far away from everybody's sight, then, you know, the military is itself the front. But if you can't put it on a military base that's, that is fulfilling obvious other functions, then you would need a cover story. And, you know, various government research projects regularly hide in plain sight with some other ex public explanation for what their activity is. And so consequently, it wouldn't surprise me, given that they didn't let a lot of people in to see what was going on, if HARP had some ulterior function. I don't think it would be mind control, um, but weather manipulation is more plausible. But I don't know. I, I haven't researched this one in detail yet, but we will. I will do the research and we'll talk about it more in the future. Uh, Richard Hansen asks, what do you know about the reports of St. Pio bilocating? Well, I, I know that I know a little bit about them. There are apparently reports of Padre Pio or St. Pio bilocating either in physical form or in some other form or having his presence be felt elsewhere. One, Some of these reports involve visual appearances where people saw him. Others seem to involve occasions where people felt his presence but didn't see him. And that's kind of a different thing. I mean, that could be telepathy rather than bilocation in the physical sense. Others involved what was called the odor of sanctity, which some people said smelled like roses and they associated it with him, or other people said it smelled like tobacco. You know, I guess <laughs> like maybe some sweet, fruity pipe tobacco or something. So it's hard to know in some of those cases. I mean, maybe someone was outside the window smoking a pipe, but who knows? In terms of what Padre Pio himself said, there is some testimony from a member of his order, and I will have a link to this in the further resources, but there is testimony uh, from another member of his order who reports him having not flat out said, I'm bilocating, but to have said things that strongly implied it. And so, at least based on that testimony, there's some substance here. Now, you could still explain all this naturally, but he is a saint, and so one doesn't want to just dismiss all this on the other hand. So, uh, it needs to be considered open-mindedly. And we'll have a link to that, and I definitely like to talk about my location in the future, and so that'll be coming up. Because there are other saints where that's been yeah. said about yeah. that. Okay. And it's 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 not according to um, I mean it's extremely implausible on natural grounds, but according to even just uh, the laws of the common interpretations of quantum mechanics, it's possible for an object to be in more than one place at a time. Normally, that is confined to the subatomic realm, but it would be possible, although very improbable naturally for it to occur with a macroscopic object like the human body. And if you then involve the supernatural, what's 
improbable naturally can become quite probable supernaturally. Uh, it would come in very handy as a parent. Let me just say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, Joe Terzos says, uh, asks, does the government use subliminal hidden TV, radio, or movie messages to influence the population? I have uh, this as with so many of these other topics on the list for the future, and we'll also have a link to subliminal stimulation in the further resources. Yes, they have tried it in the past. I have I, I don't have a specific case where the government has done that. Obviously, advertisers have tried to do that, but it would not. I'm I'm sure as part of the MK Ultra program, they did research along these lines, and they then found out what. Other experimenters have found out it doesn't really work. In order to really influence somebody, you need to give them a message that's above the sensory threshold and thus that is not subliminal. You need to influence people superliminally. In fact, didn't they make a law against subliminal advertising? They may well have. My memory on that is fuzzy because it's been a while since I've looked into this. But the fundamental fact is it doesn't work. Okay. Paul Youngworth asks, it would be great to hear an episode on the Bermuda Triangle. And I have to, to uh, as a as an editorial mm-hmm. comment, that's one of the earliest mysteries I remember ever hearing about on In Search Of with Leonard mm-hmm. Nimoy. So I'm I'm on, on board for that. Yeah, I know. Back when I was a kid in the 70s, that was one of the big mysteries, that and Bigfoot and Nessie and Aliens. So, yeah, we'll definitely be talking about the Bermuda Triangle in the future. Awesome. Kathy Sehu, uh, Kathy, I hope I said your name right. Uh, whatever happened to, quote unquote, the next ice age? Uh, I believe in global climate change, but I also have an old 1950s, perhaps, geology book that was rather alarmist about the next ice age. The phenomenon can't have just disappeared, along with that, the idea of a massive volcano eruption causing disastrous global cooling. Is there enough statistical info to calculate odds on that for any given time frame? Okay, so both of these topics are going to be on the list. Regarding a coming ice age, this is still a concern. In fact, I'll have a link in the further resources to an article suggesting a mini ice age might begin within the next 15 years due to the dearth of sunspot activity Hmm. that we've been seeing on the sun. Uh, And there are many ice ages, little bitty ones that the Earth has experienced in the past, as well as longer ones. The reason, one of the reasons you don't hear about that is because of all the global warming hysteria, that that just swamps the press. So possible ice age doesn't fit the narrative. And so it doesn't get covered as much. In terms of uh, super volcanoes, well, so those can cause global winters. That happened after the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora. Global temperatures dropped by more than five degrees Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius, and brought on the next year what was called the year without a summer or 1800 and froze to death. And so volcanic activity can cause ice ages, little bitty ones, but they're very short unless you have a bunch of volcanoes going at once, putting a lot of particulate matter into the atmosphere. In terms of the frequency of eruptions, we actually do have uh, reasonable statistics on this because we can look in the geological record and say, okay, how often have these really big volcanoes blown? Volcanic explosions are measured on what's called the VEI or the Volcanic Explosivity Index, and it's a logarithmic scale. So like each number up is 10 times bigger in explosive force than the one below. A lot of volcanoes that erupt actually are at zero on the scale. These are like the ones in Hawaii that just have lava flows, but they don't really explode. They just ooze lava. But the big, like, bang explosions that eject particulate matter into the atmosphere, those can get really big. They kind of the top of the scale on the explosivity index are seven and eight. Eight is like the biggest that we've ever seen. And they don't happen that often. A level eight event occurs on average every 17 to 45,000 years. On the level seven, which is the next level down, so this is 10 times smaller, there have only been four level seven events in the last 2,000 years. So basically one every 500 years. The probability, we're probably, now there's a lot of publicity about Yellowstone Park which is a super volcano here in the United States. And there are people who have been a little alarmist about, oh, it's overdue for an, for an eruption. Well, no, 
these things don't work that way. Nothing you can't say something is overdue because of the way the they don't happen regularly. In fact, Yellowstone may never have another massive explosion because what has to happen for that is the uh, stuff underneath Yellowstone has to get into the right configuration. But every time it blows, it changes the configuration and it may never drift into the right configuration again. So you can't say that Yellowstone is overdue. If it were to have a seven or eight at Yellowstone, we're probably tens of thousands of years away from that. And we would have years, decades, or even centuries of warning before it did because of how volcanoes are being uh, studied now. I mean, we have seismographs and all kinds of things that we're using to monitor them. And so the chance of Yellowstone exploding catastrophically in the next few thousand years has been ranked by the authorities as, quote, unquote, exceedingly small. Over, and that's over a thousand period of thousands of years. Big eruptions can be devastating for humans. Mount Toba in Indonesia blew 74,000 years ago, and that may have caused a decline in the human population, but it's not clear that it did. The last major Yellowstone eruption was 640,000 years ago, and that was before the human race existed in its present form. So not a lot of reason to worry on this front. Even Toba was 65,000 years or so before human civilization. Before civilization, though, we yeah. were around as a species at that time. Right. Okay. We'll also have more information about this and further resources, including a video you can watch about it. Colleen Rudolph asks, my 17-year-old wants to know if the fall of Adam and Eve introduced entropy into the world. Not according to the text of Genesis. If you take, even if you take Genesis fully literally and, you know, the church notes, there's symbolism involved in these texts. That's in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But even if you took it fully literally, the text of Genesis presents entropy as already at work in the world prior to the fall. And there are a couple of ways of demonstrating that. One of them is the fact that the sun and the stars are already shining. That happens even before the creation of man. And so in order for the sun and other stars to shine, you have to have energy in the sun and the stars that's diffusing out of the sun and the stars. So you have energy going from a highly concentrated state to a more diffuse state, and that's what entropy is. So stars don't shine without entropy. Also, God, before the fall, tells Adam and Eve that they can have, they can eat of any of the trees of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so that shows that uh, the way the text is presenting this, Adam and Eve already need food. And you don't need food unless you need to get new energy into your body to replace the energy that your body has been expending. And so without entropy, you, which is where energy moves from a concentrated state to a diffuse state, without entropy, you don't need to eat. And since Adam and Eve needed to eat and stars were already shining, we see that entropy was already at work in the world. Interesting. That's a, that's a very logical way of thinking about it, which is what I expect. Uh, all right, Larry, <laughs> Larry Smith asks, have there been any concrete clues as to the location of the Ark of the Covenant? Also, where is it traditionally rumored to be hidden? And who is rumored to be the last person to have it in his or her possession? Uh, I think I know the answer to that one, but uh, I'll let you go. <laughs> uh, the U.S. government in a big warehouse with lots of other pine wood box crates. Well, that's one of them. There's also some <laughs> some guy in uh, in Ethiopia, but uh, but you probably oh, know more okay. about that than I do. <laughs> yeah, I was going to mention that. Yeah, so we'll definitely be talking about the Ark of the Covenant in the future. There are a bunch of proposed explanations for what happened to it, according to one account which is actually mentioned in 2 Maccabees, uh, Jeremiah, the prophet, took it and hid it in a cave. The book of Revelation depicts the ark as being in heaven, in God's temple in heaven, although it's not clear being Revelation, is that just a symbol or is that meant to be more literal? According to a lot of people in Ethiopia, the ark got taken to Ethiopia and is housed in a church there that people, except like the caretakers, are not allowed into. This is widely believed in Ethiopia. The story, as I recall, is that Solomon gave it to Queen Sheba, 
And I find that totally implausible. There's yeah. no way Solomon has given the Ark to Queen Sheba. I think that in all likelihood, the, the Ethiopians have an object that they believe is the Ark, but I think it's much more likely it's a later reconstruction of the Ark, not the original. So if you got into the church and took a picture of it, it might look like the Ark is described in the Bible, but if you DNA tested or, or uh, not DNA tested, uh, carbon tested the wood that it's made out of, it wouldn't be as old as it needs to be. That would be my guess. There are other options as well, including one that I've heard that it, the Ark was like a war drum that is in the possession of various African tribes. I don't give that any credence either, but we will be talking about it more in the future. Brooke Kettle asks, my husband wants to know about the archaeological evidence for the Battle of Jericho and its relationship to the proposed dates for the Exodus. So the date of the Exodus is a subject that I'm still studying and we'll definitely talk about in the in on the show in the future. For now, I'm going to recommend a book that you can read if you read it's kind of pricey, but it is a it is a really good discussion of the subject. It's called From Abraham to Paul and it's by a Lutheran scholar named Andrew Steinman who is a biblical chronologer. He, his book is one of the best that's out there. A less pricey one that's also quite good, but not quite as up to date as Steinman, is Jack Finnegan's Handbook of Biblical Chronology. And he'll, he, he, he doesn't really take a position, or if he does, I think he tends to go with the younger date for the Exodus, as seeing it as in the 1200s BC. Steinman argues it for the early date for the Exodus in the 1400s BC. And those are really the two dates that scholarly opinion has centered on. The 1400 date is the traditional one, but in the 20th century, the idea of a date in the 1200s became uh, prominent. The difficulty for the 1200s view is, and that is the majority view of those who believe in the Exodus, and I believe in the Exodus, and I tend to defer, at least at the present state of my researches, to the 1200s date. But I'm quite open to being convinced by the 1400s date, and so I'm still researching that. The difficulty with the 1200s date is that we don't have archaeological evidence that Jericho was inhabited in the 1200s. It was inhabited previously and subsequently, but it looks like it may not have been inhabited in the 1200s, in which case, how could Joshua conquer it? The proposed layer that in archaeologically that would correspond or that has been thought to correspond to Joshua's conquest by carbon-14 dating seems to be a little too early. It seems to be in the 1500s rather than the 1400s. So it's like Jericho was conquered and burned by fire, but it looks like, based on carbon dating, it was about a century earlier than it should be, or a little more than a century, like 170 years. Well, Steinman argues that that's due to a problem in carbon dating in this part of the world in this time frame. I'm going to give you a couple of quotes from Steinman so that you can hear his case. He says, there is continuing controversy over the calibration of radiocarbon dating in the eastern Mediterranean basin for this period. Radiocarbon dating after the mid-2nd millennium BC agrees quite well with other chronological determinations used by historians and archaeologists. In contrast, radiocarbon determined dates before this time, especially for the 15th century BC, disagree quite sharply with other chronological determinations. And there has been an ongoing debate among scientists and archaeologists about the accuracy of the calibration scale for carbon-14 dating for this period. And then a little bit further on, he says, only subsequent research and analysis will determine how to deal with the disparity between radiocarbon dating and other dating methods for this period. In the meantime, we can conclude that there is no reason to absolutely reject the biblical dating of the fall of Jericho to 1406 BC, and that Jericho provides no evidence for the late date theory of the Exodus. So according to him, there's a problem in the carbon-14 calibration scale for this time period in this area, and therefore the things, the indications from radiocarbon dating that would put the conquest of Jericho about 170 years earlier is due to that calibration problem. The other data either supports 
he says, the 1406 BC, the 1400 state, and we don't have anything, radiocarbon dating does not support the 1200s uh, date. And because we're talking about BC, higher dates mean further back in time. Right. So that's why the 1400s date is earlier and the 1200s date is later. Okay. I should make sure (laughs) we all knew that one. Uh, Jenny asks, recently a priest spoke about the miracle at Hiroshima during the homily. I had never heard of it before. Yeah. So this is something that's known to have happened. You had a group of Jesuits living in Hiroshima, which was, as far as towns in Japan go, is kind of a Catholic town. And you had a group of Jesuits living there real near the hypocenter of the bomb, where the impact of the air blast hit the ground. And even though buildings around them were like destroyed, they were okay. They were like had some broken windows, but and they got nicked a little bit by the broken glass, but that was it. Their building didn't collapse on them. They didn't die. They weren't vaporized. And they didn't get radiation poisoning after the war. And they attributed this. They did. They lived normal lifespans. They didn't get cancer in later decades, or at least I don't have indication that they did. I do have indication is that they never seemed to suffer from the radiation in any way abnormally. And they attributed this to living the message of Fatima and praying the rosary and things like that. Interesting. I, I think I'd heard of that before, but that's yeah, yeah interesting. Okay. Michael Linder says, I saw this mysterious headline. It would be interesting to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he provides a link to a, to a headline. Yeah. So we'll definitely talk about Sodom and Gomorrah in the future. The l- article describes a preliminary finding from a group of researchers, including archaeologists, who have suggested that Sodom and Gomorrah may have been destroyed by an airburst of a meteoroid. Uh, that came in a really big one. Like a few years ago, you know, there was that one in in Russia that blew up and hurt some people on the ground. This would have been even bigger than that. And they found evidence that at a certain point about 1700 BC in the archaeological record, which corresponds roughly to the later dating for Abraham. There's also with Abraham, there's an earlier dating and a later dating. And around 1700 BC, there seems to have been an event in this area where a lot of the sand and stuff was subjected to intense heat and melted within microseconds. And so that would be produced by something like a big airburst of an incoming large size meteoroid, meteor. Interesting. Or aliens, but that's another show. Or or aliens, (laughs) but that's another show. Les Hammer uh, asks, if I add holy water from one source to holy water from another source, Will I have mixed blessings? I see what you did there. So, so <laughs> this question is based on wordplay, and thus one doesn't know if it's meant how seriously it's meant. One suspects it is not meant seriously. But if you were mixing holy water specifically for let's, let's test out the mixed blessings theory with kind of a humorous intent in real life, Rather than a reverent use of holy water, that would be an irreverent use of holy water, and it might cancel out any blessings you would get. Well, there you go. So don't mix your blessings. <laughs> Joel uh, Lowell says, Jimmy, the Jesuits come out frequently in association with conspiracy theories. Do you know the origin of this association? Is there any evidence to substantiate the Jesuit order has nefarious intent? Well, the Jesuits did actually, like, infiltrate places like England during the penal era when Catholics were not allowed to publicly practice their worship. Jesuit missionaries would come over and say and say mass for people in private houses. And in the big estates, they would often have what were called priest holes, which were a place that the priest could hide out if the authorities came looking for them. And Jesuits were involved in that activity. So Jesuits actually did infiltrate England the same way that various priests and religious infiltrate communist China today to you know bring the faith to people who are being persecuted for it. This, though, just like in China, that scene is politically destabilizing. This was seen as politically destabilizing in England. And so you had British anti-Catholics who thought of the Jesuits as these foreign invaders who are politically destabilizing, then that with that kind of uh, that led to a kind of more generalized paranoia. And some anti-Catholic authors frankly lie. They'd make up stuff, just like in China. You know, the government authorities will sometimes just lie 
and make up stuff to make their enemies look bad. And so you had eventually things like uh, a, an alleged leak of a Jesuit oath of here are, here are all the sinister things I'm going to do as a Jesuit that I'm committing myself to do. And there's just zero historical evidence for this thing. It's actually really laughable. And historians do not take it seriously. It's clearly manufactured and leaked just to make the Jesuits look bad. But uh, we will have a link to Jesuit conspiracy theories in our show notes. So why don't we talk about the things that we have as further resources for people, Dom? Sure. Let's uh, move on to that. Uh, What do we have based on what we've been talking about? So we got a bunch of articles, many of them from Wikipedia, but some from other sources as well. One of them is info both for and against John Lott's book, More Guns, Less Crime. Uh, We have the Did NASA Study Juan Diego's Tilma, as well as other information about the Tilma and the Holy House of Loretto. Uh, We have one on haunted dolls, spontaneous human combustion, the Nazca lines, Havana syndrome, that's in connection with the Havana alleged attack on the embassy. HARP, also Padre Pio and by location. This is an article on EWTN's website. One on subliminal stimuli, the Bermuda Triangle, is there a coming ice age, uh, the video I mentioned about the supervolcanoes, as well as an article on supervolcanoes themselves. We'll also have an article on the Ark of the Covenant, a link to Andrew Steinman's book From Abraham to Paul, Uh, an article from Catholic News Agency on the miracle of Hiroshima, and then also on the Sodom and Gomorrah story that uh, one of our listeners linked, and also a piece on Jesuit conspiracy theories. Excellent. And uh, any of the questions we didn't get a chance to do this this time, including a couple of first-time questions and then some second questions from folks, we'll put those on the list for next time. And they will be first up on our next Patrons Question Show. Exactly. So that's it from us. And uh, thank you to all our patrons, and especially those who submitted questions. Uh, You can submit feedback by going to patreon.com slash starquest or by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page and leave face, uh, feedback in any of those places. You can send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com or send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag mysterious feedback. Remember to like and uh, share this episode, uh, by the way, when you see it, when it shows up on Facebook in a couple months, uh, please spread it, the news and let people know about how great it is to be a patron of uh, StarQuest and to get these opportunities. We'd really appreciate it if you let others know about this. Uh, You'll find the links to all of these resources from our discussion on our show notes. Uh, We'll put those show notes first on patreon.com slash StarQuest, and eventually they'll be on sqpn.com slash mysterious when we release the episode to all listeners. That'll be sometime in October. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to and supporting Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. We hope you've enjoyed this patron's question show. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is only possible because of the generosity of our patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to support Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World and have your questions answered on future shows for patrons, go to sqpn.com give.